Well, hey, everybody. How's it going today? Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Here's to you for joining us. Ooh. The local time is 12.47, I guess, 12.48 possibly, and we will begin our session called Long Lived Yellowstone Hotspot. Long live the Yellowstone Hotspot at the top of the hour at 1 o'clock local time, 1 p.m. Pacific time. That's a little more than 10 minutes from now. Hello, Matthew. How's it going, Nick? Good, man. You? Doing well. I'm glad to hear that. Let's make sure we're doing okay. I've got a couple things to say ahead of class, and uh, you know the drill by now. Most of you do. Most of you are incredibly loyal to what we're trying to do here, and uh, sure do appreciate you. Uh, Jackie is in Ireland, and uh, Geneva and Tennessee Nana, she made it today. Uh, Michael McKay says it's 5x5 five five in Beaverton. I always love to see that. Kent is in Louisiana. Kyle, 5x5. Five five. Thanks for that report on audio and visual type stuff. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Sabres back home in Badger Land. Eric is in Sylvania, Ohio. Phil's in Mankato, Minnesota. Clear Lake, California. Hello, Rachel. Oh, Rachel's on a trip. Uh, Jau is in uh, Portugal. Selfies in Zurich, Switzerland. What up, homie? Zazu in, uh, I scrolled too fast, but I remember you're over there somewhere. Edinburgh, Scotland. Devon, UK. Nikolai is in uh, uh, someplace, sorry. Another Portugal. Vicky from Marysville, Washington. Stefan from Ireland. Bremerton, Nicole, hello. Indiana, Bainbridge Island. Vancouver, Washington. A Jurica from Croatia. How's it going? Uh, east of Fresno. Not west of Fresno, but east of Fresno. Lake City, Florida. Manchester, UK. Japanese Bao from Rotterdam. Hello. Uh, Oakley, Idaho. Renton, Washington. Derby, UK. Albany, Georgia. Mesa, Arizona. Massachusetts, Lincolnshire, UK, Fresno. We've got Emma in the room and uh, Matthew. I just saw that Bryce and Hayden and a couple others maybe are in class. Like this isn't the only face-to-face -face class this quarter in the building. So we are slowly getting back towards uh, a uh, familiar feel and sound in this building. So a few of those guys. Uh, hi, hey, Gary. Backcountry Gary's with us from Darrington. Uh, hey, Ree. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I'm encouraging people to show up early and kind of visit, but uh, some have class right before this. I didn't even think of that as a possibility. So it's wonderful. I have mentioned to you that I'm sharing this lecture room uh, with like five other professors this quarter. So I have to pack all this stuff up and get it away uh, in between our live streams, as opposed to just last quarter where I was the only guy here. I had all this stuff just set up the whole quarter. Nobody else was using the room. So uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction here, and I hope that you are uh, in some form where you are. Madison, Wisconsin. Hello, Dareth. Yeah, a few have been asking. Um, I, I, uh, this is episode five of this 351 series. Did you catch episode three, which was a short video from the field? So I think our routine will be... Uh, a Tuesday live stream, a Thursday live stream, and then some sort of episode uh, that I will post over the weekend from a field experience. And so episode three was not a live stream. It was a 15 minute video from uh, our time with most of these guys out in the field at the old Vantage Road, it's called. Hello, Hayden. You do realize I'm looking here. I know, I know I'm looking at you, but I'm talking here. You got it. Okay, good. But, but he's, he's waving. Hello, Hayden. Hello, Hayden. Hey, oh God, Bryce. Hi. Uh, I, got a, I got a handout for everybody. So on, on, every time you come in, you might just check the back table there and just see if I got something waiting for you. I got, I got no cookies today, but I got a handout that uh, will look familiar. Oh God, they are excited. Oh, they are excited for a colored handout, double-sided. Oh, mm, damn. Colorful. Colorful, totally. Mary, yes. 
colorful. Oh, you're you're you are on fire right now. You're off of a high coming out of 203. I can I think you're drunk or something. I don't know. You're you're altered in some way. What were you doing in that session, Bryce? <laughs> Yeah, you were. Yeah, you were. And Hayden was, now that I think of it, Hayden was waving at me in there too. So Hayden's a waver. I got to get used to that. Okay. A um, uh, couple more hellos to everybody at home. Hey, Hayden, people are saying hi to you. There's people in Europe. Oh, he's waving at you. Hayden's waving at you in Portugal. <laughs> yeah, Bryce is punch drunk. Yeah. Hello from Sweden. Hello. Is Bryce the new Mason? I'm not kidding. It says that right here. Are you the... Are you... <laughs> uh, all right. So, Greg, are you with us again? Greg from Tennessee. So, um, I heard from Greg. Do you remember last time I shared this kind of mystery package with this mystery rock from Yellowknife Northwest Territories? And there was no note or anything. Well... Uh, I think it's you, Greg, right, that made this happen, and uh, things got split up in the mail. So yesterday, to a, a go along with this mystery rock sample from Yellowknife, yesterday arrived a separate piece of mail that I think was supposed to arrive with the sample, Greg. I don't know, did you call these folks, Greg, or email this somehow? Uh, so there is a place that can send you the oldest, the oldest known thing on the planet, from the planet. I guess this is a business or something. I don't know. But uh, this guy up in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, uh, you can get your own, your very own 4.03 billion year old rock. Everybody's looking at this now. They're interested. They're not. They're no longer interested in the color handout. So this is uh, the Acosta River Nice, 4.03 billion years in the making. This certificate that certifies that your geologic specimen case contains the mineral zircon, which has been dated. Uh, rock extracted from the site where the world's oldest known intracrustal rock was discovered on an island in the Acosta River, Northwest Territories, Canada. So this was signed by Mark Brown, who I guess is the proprietor. So Mark, thank you if you see this, but I guess Greg is who I really need to thank for. I don't know, Greg, is this a gift? Did you? So, um, so here's a little info on, uh, I don't know how the focus is. Anyway, thanks, Greg. I will cherish it. A piece of the craton from way up north there. Oh, yeah. How come there's no chitter chatter? How come there's no, oh, I see you're copying down the outline. Yeah, let me get out of your way. Um, and uh, you will hear uh, just a, a quick uh, request. Uh, this is a repeat. Um, you're going to hear me talking about our field hike tomorrow. And townies, I again request that you do not join us in the field. Uh, I will film a little bit tomorrow uh, with those that come out and hike, and uh, I will post it over the weekend. And, and Dareth, that will be episode uh, six. Uh, the, field, the field video will be episode six. So that's how we'll roll. I'll just keep going. So if you're confused still, these numbers are the numbers for the Geology 351 collection of videos, but not all of them will be live streamed. Some of them will, I guess every weekend they'll be some kind of posted, uh, uploaded video from my little uh, gizmo and my uh, iPhone. Nice, nice. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, still can't quite read the energy in the room. I guess people are pretty businesslike here. Oh, yeah, Rye Lynn was in that class, too. How many were just in that class down the hall? Mary, uh, I can't see who you are today. Ash, Ashley's in there. Five of you. Nice. Okay, this is good. This is good. Jess, hello. Hi. Uh, oh, Logan's here. Yeah. Yeah, we'll start in just a couple minutes. The Holy Trinity has not... Oh, there they are. Now I speak of the devil. They travel in packs of three. There's Tim. 
We have no interlopers. Oh, I, Jess is kind of an interloper, actually. Tim's an interloper, now that, I'm, now that I think about it. Thanks for joining us. We will start in a couple of minutes. Oh, yeah, word is spread. Yeah, I got... So I do have a handout for you, way in the back corner. Hi. Hey, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I make an announcement about a uh, field opportunity with G uh, GPR? With How about we do it right now, real quick? Wonderful. Hey, everybody, we got a quick announcement from Jess in your class here. Just nice and loud, Jess. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Jess has got something to say here, you guys. Listen up. So if you want to come camp with us, and we basically just need some uh, field monkeys, if you want to come uh, be on the crew and help us survey and learn more about glacial landforms, then we'd love to have you. Just come talk with me after class. We'll be hanging out. Great. No question right now? What date? Uh, it's April 23rd to 25th. So we'll drive out on a Friday, come back Sunday, and just uh, camp the whole time. Nice. Okay. Thank you. All sorts of opportunities. That ain't virtual. That sounds pretty damn face to face to me. Nice. Oh boy, is there? Oh, what? What kind of? God, where are you? What's going on? Is this? Huh? Matthew. Um, Andrew is wondering if he has a question. If he can shoot me a text, sure. and then I can ask it yeah. for him. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to run that by you real quick. Good. So just in case you see me looking at my phone. Oh, I like it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Matthew. Oh, Nick, I got a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. This should just whip right up, hopefully. Okay. okay. Is it the jellyfish? Yeah. I'm sure you saw this. Jellyfish question. So USGS posted this. Oh. About Yellowstone. Oh. So is this kind of what we're looking at? Like, we've got basalt, rhyolite, and then basalt coming up from the side. This is outside of the caldera, but. Mm. That's really creative. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, mid-crustal reservoirs resonates with me. So if that's kind of what they're trying to show there, but I, interesting cartoon. I don't know if that's really kind of conventional wisdom at this point, but that's an interesting post. Thanks for catching it. USGS would never lie. No, they wouldn't, you know, so <laughs> it, it is USGS. I, I guess yeah. I missed that part. Sorry. Uh, well, yeah, let's, let's, um. Can you email me that uh, or whatever, or screen grab it or something? I we might use it somehow. I, I did. Are you Colton? What's up? Oh, Luke, I got a handout for you. Color handout in the back there. I'm doing well. Something's going on. You're looking at me. I don't know. You interloped on my class, and now you're the interloper. Yeah, now who, who's the interloper now, yeah. bitch? I'm the loper. You're the right. All right. All right. I'm gonna, keep you on well, I got to keep my eye on you. Bryce, something wrong, something terribly wrong is going to happen today. I can just feel it. I cannot be specific. <laughs> no, I have like 500 pens, but Abby has. Oh, it's God's. We got to get going. Good afternoon, friends and lovers. Welcome. This is Geology 351, and we have a good thing going here. That's message number one. We got a good thing going. It's only the end of the second week, and I feel great about what we're doing. Not only our kind of collaborative vibe, which is very, very strong, uh, but also what we've kind of stumbled into as far as science papers, as far as working on a narrative, and that continues today. Uh, I am excited to share some of this with you and also listen to you because you know that you're on stage again today. And instead of rushing you through that portion, I'm guilty of that. Last time you were all ready to go with all sorts of things to talk about Emily Cahoon's paper. And then I basically kind of gave you a lip service and, and moved on because I realized I didn't want to do a lot with the Cahoon paper. I wanted to do more with the Aaron Steiner work. This is different. This paper is brand new. You caught the date. It's January 2021. 
And I think it does a major job for us. And so I do want to slow down today. I do want to involve more of you. It's probably too uh, forceful to say I want everyone to speak at least once when we go to the uh, your portion of the session, and Bryce is already looking around. But uh, I do want to uh, get a little bit more from you because there's plenty we can chew on here. And depending on how this goes today, we might even kind of continue with some of this next time on Tuesday. Before we get to all of that, and again, I'm excited about it, and you're still copying down the outline, that's great. Tomorrow is our field day. I emailed you the directions. I emailed you the meeting time. And it's one of my favorite areas. I, have, I guarantee you will be impressed with the area. Uh, it should be very nice out there. I know we had snow and wind and all sorts of stuff. We probably still have the wind right now. But I looked at the forecast. It's supposed to be pretty calm at least tomorrow morning. And it's out there towards Othello, Washington. It's a little bit more of a drive than we did last time. But I, I know that you will be impressed. I, before I forget, I want to. I said this by email, but I want to do it in person too. If you really want to join us in the field and you cannot because of you don't have a car or you don't have any money for gas uh, or you don't have a friend in here and you don't know who to ask to carpool with, please email me. I've got options for you. We can make this happen for you. I've got options for you if you want to get out in the field and you just cannot due to a variety of reasons. If you have a conflict, I understand. If you're just totally not interested, you're oversubscribed to other things, I understand. But the field things is not required, as you know, but boy, it's, it's, it's so wonderful to be out there together. With all that said, how many are, are planning on being with us tomorrow? Yeah, most of you. That's great. I, I, I'm so excited for that. So I will see you at the designated place in time. And send me an email if you're confused about that, too. Um, last thing I'll say about that, Bryce reminded me that you all have been charged a course fee. I don't know if you saw it or not. It's an, it was an $80 fee. And that is standard for this class. And that $80 course fee pays for the vans. Hey, baby, we're not using the vans. So how come you were charged a course fee? It's my fault. Our fiscal person said in February, you don't want to do the $80 fee, I'm sure, because we can't use the vans. And I'm like, I'll talk to Motorpool. We'll be able to use the vans. Don't you worry. Well, as you know, I screwed out. Uh, I screwed out? What is that? <laughs> I struck out and I screwed up by thinking that I could actually do that. So we are in the process, which is more work for our fiscal person, Mariah, but we're in the process of getting you refunded for that. You just have to take my word for it. It's going to be a couple more weeks, I think, before we can get this. But I, I, I promise that you'll get your... $80 back, and therefore, I've saved you $80, what a hero, but I don't know if you're keeping track of how much gas costs to get out to these sites. If you come each time, it's probably more than 80 bucks. Again, I've got options for you. You let me know. Okay. Um, anything else before we start? I wanted to say one other thing. What was it? Yes, I'm emailing you tonight with our first homework assignment. You've been ex expected to do essentially zero so far, except show up. And I, I sent you that grading email and I wanna give you the first assignment. Just a heads up to look for that for me tonight. And I'll be very clear about that as well. Okay, here we go. Uh, all right, so you've got it. Uh, first of all, I wanna set the hook for today. Second of all, I'm coming to you, talking about the paper assigned to you today. You've got the handout from the paper. Then my job is to take all that input, which will be all over the place, I know that. Your input will be all over the place, and you'll, you'll see what I mean in just a second. And my job is to get us down to being disciplined and thinking about the data that we have and separate that out from the possible ideas that we are still working on, models, in other words, tectonic models to explain this stuff. That's my role, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, it's going away. So we're going the double chalkboard again like we did last time. Ryan is not required to laugh out loud like he did last time, although I really appreciated that. Whatever I said, it was uh, humorous. So just what, a, what a, an amazing guy I am. Okay, uh, I think I'm switching these around though. Screw it. No, we're not. We're just doing this. Okay. 
setting the hook. What's our magic time window for this class? Class? Between 40 and 60. Between 40 and 60. Look at this. It doesn't get more professional than this. Okay? Manila envelope. 40 to 60. So we have not yet gotten to the 40 to 60 window. That is the magic time window. We're not there yet. We're taking the scenic route. But my plan has been to start with the Yellowstone hotspot in Wyoming and work our way back in time. And by the end of today, we will be in our magic window. So what's this? This is what we've been doing so far. This is the Columbia River Salt Group, including Emily Cahoon's 17.2 start with her picture gorge basalts. But that's not the start of the story. That's not the start of the Yellowstone hotspot story. What? I thought it was. According to our chalkboard, this is the start of the Yellowstone hotspot story. And it is the quote unquote traditional way to teach the Yellowstone mantle plume story. 16.7, everything starts, but we can go back to 17.2 and use Cahoon's new dates and realize that there's kind of a regional story. And I remind you that we had this whole collection of rhyolites, even a newly discovered caldera called the Castle Rock Caldera uh, from this area. And Emma came up afterwards and said, did I miss something? Like, why is this up here? I don't get it. And we're like, I guess come on Thursday, but I'm not sure we'll come up with it then either. Camp has a model. Camp has a proposal from his paper to address not only this, but some other stuff as well. But I'm still setting the hook. Today, we are continuing further to the west in southern Oregon, dealing with Nevada a little bit, although I don't want to go that far south, and going all the way out to the west coast of what is now Oregon. You'll see why I'm phrasing it this way. But if we go back that far, if we go to the coast, we can get back into our magic time window. Let's not screw around. 56 million years ago, Vic Camp and others, not everybody, but others, see the Yellowstone hotspot out in the Pacific Ocean. I hope you got that at some point as you were reading the paper. Seletsia. Seletsia began to form offshore 56 million years ago. So we're going to today go between our Columbia River Salt group story and going back to Seletsia time. And for the first time in the class, we're actually in the magic time window that we need. Last thing I'll point out, we will eventually get into some exotic terrain discussions. Not much. Baja BC movement, hardly anything. That's too old. This is a too young situation. This is a too old situation for our magic time window. So generally, by the end of today, we will be in our magic time window, and I don't think we're leaving. I think we are truly going to be in this magic time window for the, most, uh, for the rest of the quarter. Okay? That was my hook setting. The paper you are about to tell me about is Vix Camp's paper, 2021, and you all have a two-sided collection of beautiful illustrations, most famously this guy here, which you have. And I want now, is it, now is your time, by the way. I'm hitting the button on you. And I think with the audience, I'm just going to try to hold this up here like this, the home audience, but you've got it in front of you. You can see it in real time, in real space. You can see what, what I'm pointing at here. And even if you're a rookie to geology, you're right out of 101, you can contribute here. These don't all have to be super highbrow statements. Just new statements to you. And this is going to go fast. So I just want to fill the air with all of your reports. Here we go. Ryan's going to get us started. Uh, 
Ryan's starting with, you know what? I'm going to hold you off, Ryan. Let's do some, some nice, simple statements that we understand that we want to report on. Uh, 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 er, what is it? Ariel. Ariel, thank you. Yep. Red and blue stuff. So I'm I'm gonna just I'm gonna keep this going. True, this is truly gonna be lightning. I'm not gonna just talk for 20 minutes after each contribution. So he does have a red star and a blue star, and he's realizing that there's two different potential stories here. And there's a group of researchers that like the blue star. There's a, another group of researchers that like the red star. Let's hold off on what that really means. Let's keep it going. Uh, Kyle. So Kyle's noticing we have a black dotted line going through the known Yellowstone calderas as they get older and older and older. And then maybe you're also talking, Kyle, about this dotted gray, which is, I don't know, is that something different? Let's get off of it right now, Mary. What do you think he means by that? There's more stuff going on than we know. There's more stuff going on than we know. I love it. Let's keep going. This is not meant to make sense. This is meant to just get as many people involved as possible. The home viewers can be patient with us here. Uh, ideally, we'll get everybody involved at least a little bit. Uh, Rachel. Um, slab rupture and adiabatic rise of this accumulated mantle generated by modal eruption of the flood crystal highlights in 17 to 16. All right, so what the hell? <laughs> Sorry, Patrick. Slab rupture. I'm not sure what a slab is. I'm not sure what a rupture is. I can guess what those are. Uh, let's keep moving. I'm going to come. I'm going to circle back. Tim. Slab shielding. Tim's uh, mentioning that he's he's noticing this timeline down here, which goes from brand new back to essentially 42 million years ago, and we have two white areas, which are times of quiet. Again, slab, huh? I don't understand. Rylan. Um, so like, Go ahead. Thank you, Rylin. He's, he's plotting. Uh, there's many reasons I love this paper. One of them is he's kind of putting a lot of different uh, kinds of studies onto one diagram. Of course, it's very busy. That's why I felt like I wanted to actually blow it up for you and give you a, a hard copy. I mean, it, it takes a long time to figure out all these symbols and all these colors and everything else. The red are... Um, plate reconstruction studies, as I understand it, uh, by using reference frames. So he's got, did you catch this? These two purple things out in the water are two different ideas using reference frames, either the Atlantic reference frame or the Pacific reference frame. Don't ask for, for details. I don't know what I'm talking about. That these are two potentially nailed down spots for the Yellowstone mantle plume. Here, these dates don't really totally make sense with the rocks as they're plotted, correct? Like, look at the distance. Look at how it looks like North America didn't move very far between these two spots in that 10 million year stretch. And the ages of some of these volcanic rocks don't work with this as well. So he's not trying to confuse us, but he's trying to sh basically synthesize and uh, correlate between these different uh Subdisciplines to show us that there's plenty that still needs to be worked out. As as Mary said, there's lots going on here. More, especially if you haven't spoken yet. We'd love to hear from you. This is a safe, warm, nurturing environment. Uh, oh, God. It's a vowel. Help me. Ash. Yeah. And with high volume of 
Thank you very much. Yes, we can take our main phase story, which is not even really super portrayed here, right? He doesn't have the main Columbia River Basalt group all over the place. But do you recognize this is something that looks familiar to us, right? What is this? What are these things? that Did we talk about any of this stuff last time? The answer is this. What in here is recognizable? The Castle Rock Caldera. He's got it. Uh, uh, CR. Uh, I didn't use the phrase, but we're going to use it today. The Lake Owyhee Volcanic Field. This is our thing Emma was asking about. Like, wh why are we off track? This is the Lake Owyhee Volcanic Field. I was kind of talking about it as the Strawberry Volcanics, but if you remember the details, the Strawberry Volcanics were just one of this whole collection of rhyolites. So in case you have not made the connection between the pink blotches and the pink circle on the chalkboard from last time. That's one of these yellow blotches, including the blue star. Remember, we, we ended on the thought that there's an evidence for some sort of, if it's not a mantle plume, it's some sort of heat source that's feeding that Lake Owyhee volcanic field. Hayden. Thank you. Uh, Hayden's going way here to the coast of Oregon today and looking at the dates of these rocks, 40, what was it, 42 to 34, and that's a time of, what was the phrase, overriding? Who's overriding who? The North American plate is going over the top of the frickin' mantle plume, and we have rocks from that time. This is part of my job is to help us understand these colors if we don't all have it. This is beautiful. I love you as a group. I love you as a group. Individually, hmm. I love you as a group. <laughs> JK, just kidding. That's a sick burn. Okay. Anybody else want to say anything? Re. Thank you. It has not been mentioned yet. This green is a belt of, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Is it Atticite? And, and what do you know about, or what did you read, or what do you know about Atticite? What did you just say? Partial melting of an altered basalt, possibly, as the source for this Atticite. I have a little bit about Atticite. I did email Vic Camp and heard from him yesterday. He just gave a Zoom uh, lecture uh, in the last hour. And so I'll find the recording of that and post it. But he mentioned, yeah, I can't, I can't join your live stream. I'm going to be finishing up my lecture for Eastern Washington University. So great guy, in addition to really interesting work. I think a couple more. I still saw some hands. Ryan, I pushed you off. Now I'm going to come back to you now. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How can we tie the Laramide orogeny, which is the, the Rocky Mountain buildup, how can we tie the basin and range to this story? Uh, so Ryan's really work, he, Ryan's working the corners here. Ryan's not coming down the strike zone, all right? He wants to go far afield, and I'm not willing to go there again. You are like a wild horse. I'm trying to tame you, son. I, I don't want to do that. I want to keep that, that curiosity going, but we're not going to, that's too far afield for us. Last call for a couple more. Matthew. Um, I know we mentioned the lag between the yeah. time and the eruption. Yeah, yes. Um, Talked about from 40 million to 10 million years ago. Yep. Um, they thought that the, the eruptions transitioned from volcanism above the, the, the plume material, like the main amount of plume material, yep. to above the trail, the tail of the plume material. So, plume head, plume tail. Uh, who wants to spitball me with me right now? What else besides the plume? 
Let's turn this thing over. Let's turn this puppy over. So one of the, this is also Vic Camp. One of these is from your assigned paper. Which one? The left. This one is from the assigned paper today. And actually, you know what? Let's just, just pause. Do, do you have anything from this assigned uh, uh, illustration? Looking at this, do, do, do you want to uh, spitball with me? Do you understand anything of what was done here? Did you get that far in the paper? Anybody feel like it? I can, I can do it if you want, but anybody want to try? Go ahead, Ryan. If it's literally a tear, and we're still talking about a slab, some of us don't even know what that means yet. That's coming with our interpretations or our models, but that's right. I just want to point out that here it is one more time. Our strawberry volcanic field from last time, including some others, that's yellow with the blue star, correct? That thing freaking lines up with the western snake river plain. The western snake river plain. Now, come on. I went to graduate school here. Andrew in this class, not with us today, is going to grad school here in Pocatello starting this fall. This whole area was studied carefully by many of our grad students at Idaho State University 30 years ago. And nobody then had any idea why the Western Snake River Plain was a thing. It's still a bit of a mystery as far as I can understand. But as I was reading, I think it was Cahoon, she saw some geochemical signatures that were similar. Do you, does anybody remember this? With no, Maybe it wasn't Cahoon. Maybe it was Steiner saying some of the rhyolites here have the same trace elements as some of the volcanic rocks in the western Snake River Plain. And maybe this, this, this story about this isolated volcanic field has something to do there. Okay, I think that's enough. I love it. Uh, of course, you can continue to be part of our discussion here. I'll try to interrupt as much as you like, but I think I want to now take over just a little bit. And I mentioned Idaho State University for a couple of reasons. David Rogers was my uh, graduate school advisor. You work on a thesis when you get a master's degree and you have an advisor. You have a committee, but you have a main advisor. And my advisor was Dave Rogers. And he was perfect for me. This is the late 1980s, now before any of you were born, before the internet, before a lot of things. Life was simpler back then. But this guy was fresh out of Stanford. He was brand new to the job. And he did so many wonderful things for me. And he's still there at that school. But the main thing he did for me that I have used almost every day of my teaching, and those of you that have already had me in 101 or another class, you know that I hit this very hard. Data versus interpretation. Can we just please start with what we know? Can we please not put everything in a blender and go right to mantle plume and it's a freaking vortex and we tear it and we do everything else and it's too much. And here's why this is important. The data is permanent. The data in your scientific papers is there for future generations. Yes, the tools and the techniques may improve. Yes, the precision may improve, as we just talked about in the last few sessions. But the data, if it's separated from the interpretations, is there to be used in current day, but in future generations as well. It's valuable data, factual information carefully collected. That's different than interpretation. That's different than ways to explain the data. I think you all know this, but it's worth, I think what we were trying to do here was to get as many people involved and we did, but some of that was data and some of that was interpretation. And here's the danger. 10 years from now, some idea about the plume or a tear in the slab, again, whatever that is, is proven to be incorrect. In other words, the idea is proven to be incorrect. And what's the tendency? We throw the baby out with the bathwater. Do you know what that idiom means? Have you ever heard it? I'm from Wisconsin. There's a lot of idioms back there. Sweating like a butcher. You know, we'd say that when we were like 
16 years old. I'm sweating like a butcher. Throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't want to throw out the interpretation. Bryce is trying to figure it out. What does it mean, Bryce? <laughs> okay. Okay, it's, 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 now, it's now a baby discussion, and grandchildren, and I'm 50. Okay, right. You don't want to take something valuable, some of the data, and throw it away along with this idea that was in the paper as well. If we separate the data from the interpretation, we can throw the old idea away, but we can keep the precious data. That's my role here. So let's do it. Oh, now there's a breakout discussion about babies and dirty bath water. And why do babies need to be in a bathtub anyway? What's that, what's that all about? And hygiene? Not good. Oh, uh, I love you. I love you. I love you. All right. Let's start with the data. And Camp has done a nice job with that. His paper was written differently than many scientific papers. He broke it into chapters. He was almost telling you a bedtime story, wasn't he? He was laying it out in individual time chapters. And that not only was done in the text, but also was done with this. So I am going to get your camera right up next to the home viewer's camera because I want of us both to see this. So what part of this story is familiar to us? What colors work with what we've talked about already in this discussion? Tim? Yellow and red. Yellow and red. Correct. We started with the Yellowstone hotspot in Wyoming. We've worked our way across southern Idaho. We're still red-ish. And yellow, did you catch it? Yellow is younger, mm, let's just say younger than 17. I know we're tossing in Emily just a little bit, but younger than 17, including the rhyolites. So what I want to write on the board is focus on the data that we have broken into three main chapters. I forget if I said it that way in the outline, but that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to break our data into three main chapters, and the three main chapters are separated by white, separated by absolute quiet times. Be very, very quiet. Ain't nothing happening. Ain't no lavas coming to the surface. So let's do it. I broke it out. I got chicken scratch all over the place. Can I find what I need to find? Here it is. So three volcanic chapters... Only one of them that is quasi-familiar to us. Uh, younger than 17. Let's do that. 17 to 15. Let's do that. This is the L-O-V-F. The M-V-F. And the H-R-C-C. I'm using abbreviations because you have the abbreviations on your handout. Yellow. Who can help us quickly? I guess I can. I spent, I don't know, 20 minutes going through that illustration. All those little abbreviations, all the little symbols. Did you catch it? The little circles are mapped calderas. The little boxes are just a rhyolite location, not necessarily a mapped caldera. And we have the Lake Owyhee volcanic field. I'm reading backwards, but hopefully it will make sense to you. The McDermott volcanic field and the High Rock caldera complex field, all between 17 and 15. Let's make some statements. I'm not doing the storytelling yet. We're just talking about the data that we have. And camp is doing a nice job 
finding all this, putting it all in one diagram. It's a busy diagram. This is a broad regional story, is it not? This is not all right on the Yellowstone hotspot track. We have three distinctly different areas with bimodal volcanism, I guess, but he's emphasizing the fact that most of this is phallic. Most of this is silicic. Most of this is rhyolitic in composition. I'm talking about the yellow. Now, somebody help me. What is the difference then between the blue and the red star? Did you drill down to that? The, thank you, Tim. The blue and the red stars are two possible locations for magmatic, magmatic centers. doesn't have to be mantle plume necessarily, but we have heat sources feeding those volcanics. And yes, some of the groups like the blue location, some of the groups like the red. I don't know if there are groups that like both. But if we're trying to group data, and that's what I'm trying to do here, we have a bunch of this bimodal volcanism, including a bunch of rhyolites that are not all in a similar trend like this. We doing okay so far? Then there's a gap on the timeline, a noticeable Gap, 20 to 17. This is data. There's no lavas. There's no volcanic centers. Where'd the calderas go? Like you're, I don't care what kind of lava. I just, I just need some lava during that time. Nothing. Between 12 and, uh, 20 and 17. I'm going to run out of room if I don't use my space a little bit more carefully. 30 to 20 is the next of the three volcanic chapters. We're going back in time, are we not? This is also a regional story. Bark. Back arc regional volcanism. What color are we using for this chapter? Green. Teal. Okay, if you don't like green, teal. So graphically, he's doing a nice job right here between 30 and 20. Where are we? Generally in Eastern Oregon. But he's got two different ways to portray this. The eye-catching one is this, known as the, what did you say, Re? Atakite or Adakite? Atta. Atakite is this green area. Okay, so I don't know what an Atakite is. I know Bree, I just, Bree just told us. But as I mentioned, I emailed Vic. And I want to read the email to you. It includes... The Atticite. Actually, does anybody want to weigh in on this back? I'm sorry. I want to do one more thing before I read that to you. In addition to the Atticite belt, is there something else that's from this time window in his symbology? What else is green on this map? We've got a dashed green going all the way around this area. This is a wide area of eastern Oregon. And he labels it area of back arc volcanism. Now, you're taking this class from me. I still don't see crazy amounts of evidence that back arcs are significant. I still just see back arcs as a place. Like you're on the you're either in the fore arc or the back arc. We know a volcanic arc is the arc we're talking about. Do you know that a line of volcanoes is known as a volcanic arc? The Cascades are our current volcanic arc, a continental volcanic arc, and you're either in the fore arc or the back arc. In Washington, where's the fore arc today? It's freaking Seattle, man. 
You're in the Puget Lowland. That's the four arc. That's basically the basin that you cross before you get to the arc. Get it? And then we, Ellensburg, are in the back arc. Now, 30 years ago, I was being taught about all this massive amounts of extension in the back arc and all this you know, circulation of the mantle beneath the back arc. At the time, I was confused. I think I'm still like, okay, so where's all this extension today in Ellensburg? Where's all these lavas coming out of the ground in the back arc? I don't get it. I don't think it's a thing, is it? You want to say something, Tim? Okay. Go ahead. But the thing I've tried to associate is it's the volcanic arc that we're using to form a back arc. Yeah. It's formed partially from the subduction zone. I'm going to gonna hold you off. I'm going to hold you off. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I'll, I'll steer you away for now. We can talk after class if you like. So the back arc, I'm viewing the back arc as a region truly to the east of the crest of the Cascades. And there's a bunch more volcanism spread diversely through this area. Okay. Now, I think I want to pick up the pace just slightly. In fact, I'm sure of it. The Attic Heights are a big part of this story. Here's me. Hey, Vic. I'm really struggling with understanding significance of Attic Heights and their importance in this discussion. Would you have a few sentences to help me? See what everybody agrees on with Attakites, if anything. Here we go. Vic, yesterday. The original idea is that these rock types form from melting oceanic crust. Re was on that. Of a downgoing oceanic slab. Okay. A slab is an ocean plate that is going down a subduction zone. If that's been unclear to you, hopefully it's clear now. We know what subduction is. We know that the Juan de Fuca plate today subducts beneath Washington and creates the arc, the volcanic arc. Well, that's the slab. That's the slab of ocean floor that continues to go down. Are you aware that the slab does not go away when it subducts? That we can continue to follow the downgoing ocean plate into the mantle? We can I don't think we'll throw that into today, but that's also part of this story. Okay, what's an Attakite? They used to think it was just simply melting of ocean crust in a downgoing slab, going down the subduction zone, downgoing slab. But as others have pointed out, there are many other possibilities, and so there is no consensus at all on their genesis. However, this is Vic, we embrace the original definition because we can rule out other possibilities. One being the melting of mafic lower crust. I'm going to pick up the pace because I don't understand what he's talking about now. This is not likely because the crust is too thin in this region. And Attakites cannot be generated because the base of the crust is within the plagioclase stability zone. Attakites are defined chemically by their high strontium idi What's why? Yttrium. Yttrium ratios, which requires strontium to be an incompatible element in the source rock. If plage is present, then strontium will always be present as a compatible element. In the slab, the mafic basaltic crust is converted to amphibolite and then to eclogite, where plagioclase cannot exist. Isn't that nice? He gave me all sorts of respect. I'm talking to a geologist. He'll get it. Yeah. I, 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 I was nice and slow in the first two sentences because I understood. Now, I'm going to forward this one to you as well. I'm going to forward Emily Cahoon's email to you because some of you know that background. I don't. And I'll forward this one to you as well. What I do want to say is that my fishing around has helped me understand that an Attakite is a very rare andesite. It's an andesite with some unusual isotopic signatures involving that strontium yttrium ratio, which is way beyond me. But I would like, at least for now, to visualize Attakites as a rare igneous rock. There's a belt of them between 30 and 20 million years ago in the back arc. And because of this weird 
isotopic ratio signature of the adekites. Wait for it. VIX model, I'm cutting to the model, I can't help it. I'm cutting to the interpretation. I can't help it. Sue me. He likes a portion of the slab being melted, altered, whatever, but whether it was re in person or Vic by email, the thought is the Attikites are somehow the result of melting and getting some of that slab material that has subducted back up to the surface. So if you have Adam. You have an Attikite belt, which we do between these two ages. You have evidence of some sort of slab below eastern Oregon that is being altered, modified by the plume. Again, I'm doing this out of order now, but I just wanted to cut to something with a sexy discussion. So the Attikites are related to that slab that's down going. I want to keep it moving, and then maybe we can open it up a little bit. There's another gap. By the way, I'm sorry. Um, so where did this figure come from? Uh, this is from a paper that you're not responsible for, but it's in the list of science papers. It's also by Vic Camp. So you were responsible for Camp 2021, the long-lived title. But I encourage you, if you have any interest at all, to look at Camp 2017, which talks about this story here. And really good illustrations talking about the fact that these interpretations we're about to get to probably next time as opposed to today. Okay, the gap he has before the back arc story is here. Again, your model needs to have some way to explain why we just shut off the magma. And this is a significant gap. This is going 34 to 30. And then we're finally to Hayden land. Thank you. Sorry. And Hayden land... is between 42 and 34, what color on your illustration? Thank you. Blue. Today, the coast range of Oregon. And there's lots of names there. I prefer just to call this one of the kind of regional names that he used. I think he called this the Tillamook. Oh, uh, shit. He had a phrase I can't remember. Episode, maybe? Yes, the Tillamook episode, a typical stage. Yeah, either one. And so I'll give this to you verbally just to help you kind of see it. He's got three different. Uh, collections of rocks there. Those are the three blue, if you can see well, there's three little blue circles within the blue region. So there are some Tillamook volcanics in that age window. There's some Yakats basalt and some Grays River volcanics. Can you see them with the fine tooth comb there? These rocks are mostly basalts. If I put this down, M-O-R-B or I-O-B, those that have had rocks and minerals or mineralogy, what do those symbols mean? What do, what do those acronyms mean? M-O-R-B. Does anybody know? Thank you, Rachel. Mid-Ocean Ridge Basalt. It's a common acronym. M-O-R-B stands for Mid-Ocean Ridge Basalt. You're like, what's that? It's a freaking Mid-Atlantic Ridge the East Pacific rise. It's a spreading center. It's a divergent plate boundary. It's the, it's the chemistry of the basalts that come out in those situations. What does IOB stand for? Or is it OIB? <laughs> is it OIB? 
Oh, God. Ocean Island Basalt. I think, yeah, it's OIB. Dyslexic much? My point is we have basalts in the blue area created in the ocean with the trace elements and the major elements all telling us that that's the story. Now, I'm happy we spent time with this. I'm happy we went at kind of a slower pace and less of a pushy, pushy pace from me. But there's a trade-off. We're not as far as I wanted to get today. Because the, the fun part is talking about an interpretation. And I feel like I want to do in the last two minutes something along those lines. So I think I just want to do it verbally. I'm going to hold this up in front of the home audience camera, maybe yours too. And let me just see if you picked up on any of this before we quit. And then we're going to come right back to this um, next time. Ready, go. Originally, I want to do it here. I want to do it here. Where was the Yellowstone hotspot 56 million years ago, students? It was offshore. And it created something we're going to talk about next time called Siletzia. It was a huge oceanic plateau. A huge oceanic plateau coming next time. Oceanic plateaus are monsters out in the Pacific Ocean, built off of the ocean floor. The Yellowstone hotspot did that, according to Camp and many others. So the Yellowstone hotspot was dealing with pure ocean crust, oceanic crust. Uh-oh. But North America is drifting to the southwest. And the distance between a fixed Yellowstone hotspot mantle plume and the continent of North America is getting closer and closer. Until, does anybody have it? Until how long ago when North America started to drift over this hot spot. 42, Luke. Mm. 42 million years ago, and the rocks of the Tillamook volcanic field tells us this. That instead of the Yellowstone hot spot burning a hole in oceanic material, suddenly now, and this is tricky, I didn't visualize this till this morning, until now, the Yellowstone hotspot is burning a hole in the thing that it made out in the water. This is freaking Siletzia, man. This is Siletzia that was created out in the water, but Siletzia was moved and accreted 51 to 49. Just play along with me. Siletzia is added to North America, but now, 42 million years ago, according to Luke, North America drifts over the mantle plume. And so the thing that was created by Siletzia is now being penetrated by new lavas. Pretty sweet. Didn't have that in my noggin until a few hours ago. But we continue the story. I promise I'm almost done. Now, as we drift the rest of North America over the stationary mantle plume, the mantle plume is now dealing with a third entity. The accreted uh, exotic terrains that have different kinds of lithologies inv involving metamorphic rocks like serpentinite or gneiss, all sorts of things there. And then there's a fourth thing that the Yellowstone hotspot is going to have to deal with. What is that? It's going to deal with the craton. It's going to deal with the other side of the strontium 706 line. So in my mind, and I only really saw it until the way that Vic laid that paper out and said a few things that just put off a couple light bulbs in my mind. A relatively simple, fixed mantle plume, which is starting down at the core mantle boundary and coming all the way thousands of kilometers to the surface 
is dealing with pure ocean floor, then it's dealing with the Soletsi Oceanic Plateau, then it's dealing with exotic terrain material of Eastern Oregon, then it's dealing with the craton of interior North America. Four distinctly different things to penetrate or to melt through or to invade from below. And that's why this signature appears to look so different than this signature, which appears to look so different than this signature, which appears to look different than what we had out in the ocean floor. Boy, this is cool stuff. And the last thing I say, I promise, is that, of course, it's not just a mantle plume dealing with North America. There is a subducting ocean floor called the Farallon Plate, the slab, that not only is trying to subduct during this story, but there's evidence that it broke. And the slab breaks off, and a bunch of extra goodies are coming to the surface with a break-off episode. And you're like... Uh, we'll have practice thinking about it and looking at it, but just a little sneak peek, when we get up to central Washington, there's break-off belt magmas up here too. It's not just down there along this story. Fun, kind of awkward today. It always feels like it's awkward when I'm trying new stuff. We're going to find places where the slab in the subsurface broke off. Okay, I'm going to see most of you tomorrow at the secret spot at the secret time. I love you and goodbye. Yeah. I, I can see us going... Uh, you're not taking offense to that, Tim, when I kind of shut you down sometimes. Because, no, no, yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. I'll be with you on a second. I'm just going to talk to a couple of students. Hey, if you got questions, we'll do some live QA. Thank you. Matthew. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we say what the original composition of the magma, the, the plume, the magmatic body mm -hmm. that originally created, like, did, did it start with Celestia and we don't have any evidence going back and can we use the composition of the basaltic magma of Celestia to say that that's what the original Yellowstone hotspot composition was or can we not do that? I can answer your question this way. This is maybe the only way I know how to answer it. If you have a mantle plume interacting with a pure ocean plate, you're going to create a certain chemistry of lavas. Right. And the opposite end of that is if you are having that same mantle plume melting thick continental crust, and those are totally different chemistries and you're going to create something totally different. The tricky part for me is this transition time in between the two where the mantle plume is dealing with a whole bunch of different kinds of rocks of these exotic terrain lithologies. So if you're asking about the original chemistry of the mantle plume, I don't, I don't know if we can do that, okay. but we can, we can deal with the result of the heating right. of the mantle plume of the material over right. the top. Because we know. Okay. Yeah. And then Andrew, I Andrew. Think, was wondering if the um, hello Andrew the rotation of the plate was being represented. Um, oh yeah. See now that's part of yeah. the email that I was going to add. I was going to bring in the Crooked River Caldera. The Crooked, yes, the Crooked River Caldera in Central Oregon. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vic is not talking about clockwise rotation in this okay. paper at all, which was a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. uh, next week, we'll try to involve the clockwise rotation. Okay. But for this story, um, not yet. he's not dealing with it. Okay, yeah. thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you, Matthew. How come I can't come up with your name like immediately? I don't know, it's okay. It's, Ar it's Ariel. It's like the princess. It's like the princess. I get, I've, I've gotten on most of my life. Okay, maybe I'll call you a princess. Do you have a no, shorter question? Not. 
Um, yeah, so I have like a little car. Is it going to be fine yep. going out there? No problem. Okay, cool. Yep. I know, so do I. I used to yep. drive a blazer, but you know, then the transmission just uh, happened. Uh, so now no I problem have at all. Okay. Yep. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, good. Question. So it's talking about lag time between eruptions. Yes. Right. So obviously it's not going to take as long to burn through here than it is here because this is thicker than this. Right. Yes. Okay. So, so it, talking to my friends about it. Um, it was talking about lag times between eruptions right. when, and then when the hot spot was actually there. Yep. So I was wondering, yep. oh, do we see like, are there numbers that show us like a smaller lag time here than here? Or like, is there a bigger lag time that we can see from when it crosses over from eruptions? You're doing some heavy lifting here mentally, and I'm impressed by that. It's a debatable topic. And so far with us right now, we're just identifying these lag times and not saying, not trying to explain them. Well, so it makes sense because especially with here with how thick it is, it's releasing all of this magma that's like working its way through the crust, but the plate's still moving. So the hot spot's moving, but the magma doesn't. It moves with the plate. If I can tell you're on this. And so if you wanted to peek at the 2017 camp paper, mm -hmm. he's talking more about a model where the slab is there and it's causing the mantle plume to pool up underneath. So he explains the gap by saying, we're just going to like... So it's almost blocked, but it's we're working blocking its it. through the block. Yes, eventually. yes. And that's where we're headed next is to try to see how his ideas about blocking the mantle plume and then finally then having a jailbreak essentially and have a bunch of this stuff Especially come up since this is Oregon and Idaho. So this is, yes, this is still over here where it technically should be thinner, but right. it has that extra block. Yes. So it would almost make it that you couldn't really see when it switches because it almost makes it equal. Correct. I like what you're thinking about relative thickness of the crust, but according to him and maybe others, that's not a big variable in this. Is it? Well, it's still crustal stuff. Is still it's a change, it, but as far as it's not like, you're kind of working with, you know, aren't you getting a lot more mantle plume to the surface if you have very thin crust versus thick? As I understand it, it's more about how, when are we going to be blocking the, the heat source as opposed to letting it come up easily. Keep working on it. Keep working on it. Good. Okay, I got to talk to the home audience here. Thanks, you guys. Okay, thanks for your patience. Um, we still have people just visiting. It's, it's just so wonderful to have that. Uh, let's do some live Q&A if, if you're up for it. And uh, uh, upper case, please. Uh, I agree, David. Ariel's question is great. She's, uh, I don't know her very well, but oh, now she's, she's talking to others about her question. Nice. Uh, Death Mall, how was the hotspot stationary in the ocean? Ocean crust also moves slowly. Well, I try not to get fancy unless I'm forced to get fancy. Obviously, look at me. So um, in this case, I just visualize those hotspots as being fixed, regardless if there's ocean crust moving over the top of them or continental crust moving over the top of them. Now, Dave, one of the Davids here is pretty hot on the idea that a mantle plume is usually tied to some sort of spreading ridge. And we'll get into that a little bit here, um, or even a triple junction somewhere, but I, 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 can't, I can't do that here. So, you know, the Hawaiian hotspot is beneath the ocean plate. The Pacific plate's moving to the Northwest. We have this beautiful seamount trail. So, I just think of those mantle plumes as fixed and regardless if it's ocean crust or continental crust or continental crust composed of uh, accreted terrains, I just think of these passing ships going over this stationary blowtorch. That's just me. Uh, nice try, Randy. Gotcha. Uh, more, um, I'll scroll back. I'm not seeing a lot of uppercase right now. Douglas, could water content of the slab uh, or oceanic crust be part of the quiet time? I'm not sure. So I didn't know how much ground we were going to cover today. And I now see that we'll spill this over into Tuesday, which is our next live stream. Uh, you maybe heard me talking to Ariel. Vic Camp really likes, I don't think it's just Vic.
one of the main ways that Vic and others explain a gap in volcanism is that the slab, the ferrolon plate that is subducted is still there, but it's blocking the mantle plume from reaching the crust, the continental crust. And so you pool this hot mantle, I guess is one way to say it. And that explains the quiet time. And then as soon as you get off of a quiet time and you have this kind of a series of volcanic fields all showing up regionally, that that's one way to do it. You eat your way through uh, the slab, as I understand. But I'm just starting to think about uh, this. R, why does Nick live in Washington when he knows the severe dangers of volcanoes, earthquakes, and tsunami in that area? Well, I live here because it's a very beautiful place. It's an exciting place geologically. And I know that the risk of those events happening in a human lifetime are quite low. It's a risk, but it's, uh, it's not a high enough risk to uh, feel like I'm putting uh, me and my family in, in danger. And uh, Ellensburg is a long way from the ocean, I think. Jerome, what parts of Washington and Oregon were created by Seletsi? I guess that's going to be coming next week, Jerome. Um, but basically, Seletsi was an oceanic plateau that is now making up pretty much all the real estate in Washington and Oregon west of the crest of the Cascades. I would think of it that way. And you're like, whoa, I don't think so. I've, I've, I've collected rocks in Puget Sound. I don't see any Celestia basalt there. Well, most of it's in the subsurface because it's such an old story. Kent, what happened to the spreading ridge that the hot spot was straddling? Yeah, you're way ahead of us here. Let's wait. Glenn, so the quiet time was pooling leading to the CRBG. Uh, that's one way to say it, yes. Um, I think that is the way to say it right now, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to scroll back in time. Adrian, Iceland is a hot spot as well as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That's true. M Geofire, can we deduce size of the hot spot based on transition zones? I don't know about based on trend. Well, what is a transition zone in this case? I think there continues to be a debate about the width of a mantle plume. Um, yeah, I don't have much more to say there. Sorry. Dogney, is the Strontium 706 line the same as the Wiz? Uh, they do, they are the same place. Yes, uh, this is called the Western Idaho Shear Zone, uh, where there's evidence of major uh, right lateral offset of Oregon against Idaho. And that also happens to be at the old coastline, but we don't have massive amounts of offset uh, all along the Strontium 706 line, but it, at, at that place near Grangeville, uh, Idaho and down to Whitebird and Riggins, you're right, same thing. Pat Miller, are the Chalice Volcanics part of this time frame? Um, no, but we're getting closer, Pat. So those that have been loyal to us know that, that we did this exotic terrain A to Z series where I was kind of doing similar things, but with a much older time frame. And um, I think I'm going to do an Eocene A to Z live stream series at some point, maybe this fall or winter when I'm when the weather's junky and there's nothing else to do. And Pat, in that case, I think we will be heading to the Chalice Magma system um, and eventually get into the Rockies and do all sorts of things. Uh, and I thought maybe I would do that here. I thought maybe we would head to the Chalice here. But I think there's enough for us to work on just in central Washington that I won't do a full treatment of the Chalice Volcanics. But I'll just say right now that the Chalice Volcanics are part of our time window, our magic time window, yes. Less is the NNR a rift valley? I don't know what the NNR is. Oh, I see it. 
Yeah, well, this is a geologic symbol for a graben. So there must be a normal fault on either side of that. And this is a block in between that fell down. But uh, I'm chicken to go into Nevada right now. I don't know. I don't even know geography of Nevada, let alone understanding Vic Camp's work down in Nevada that's part of this story. So we'll conveniently be uh, avoiding that for a number of reasons. Saber, are there any broken slab lavas near Ellensburg? Yes. We are heading to that in this series. Snoqualmie Pass, Tianaway Formation, it's coming. So it's almost like I planned this. Uh, to, to be honest, I, I had not looked really carefully at this paper by Vic Camp 2021 until yesterday. And I was like, wow, this is like perfect to follow up on what we did last time. But I, I, I just lucked out. Like I, I didn't know that that was part of this paper. So it's almost like this is guiding itself at it's, it's some, it's some weird level. Let me scroll down to live. We'll do a few more. I'm impressed with your uh, interest here. Oh, it's John. Yeah, John likes the, the uh, mantle plume. Here he is talking about a spreading ridge again. Okay, John. Are spreading ridge upwellings as deep as their hot spot plume neighbor? I don't know, John. I, I get a very strong feeling that you know far more about spreading ridges and triple junctions and mantle plumes than I do. And so I, I may get up to your speed at some point, but I, I'm definitely not there now. Uh, in fact, if you've been with us for other programs in the past, I've confessed that I've, I've always meant to just learn about the ocean floor, just to learn about what's down there and learn about other hot spots and seamount chains and some very basic things with submarine geology that I don't understand or haven't thought about at all, even submarine canyons. And I don't know, just thinking out loud, um, what will we do on next time, which is Tuesday of next week with this group? We'll definitely talk about Celestia, but maybe that's an excuse. I don't know. Maybe, maybe third, I don't know. Maybe, maybe a week from today, maybe I'll just try to do some just general oceanic plateau size of things. Yeah, maybe I'll just take a break from the narrative and just spend time with the ocean floor. Not sure of that. Ronnie. Does the plume slab interaction generate stratovolcanoes or just domes? Well, Ronnie, thanks for the question. This plume slab interaction. We only really got as far today as saying that the adekites, these, these special andesites, uh, seem to be a direct result of a plume uh, melting a slab where the slab is is blocking the mantle plume from getting to the surface, as I understand it, Ronnie, right now. So typically, no, stratovolcanoes are, are specifically from ocean plate subduction. And since we're talking about a plume interacting with the slab, I, I don't think we should visualize stratovolcanoes. Uh, David, when did we realize that Yellowstone is a supervolcano? Well, You know, I, I did my master's thesis on the northern edge of the Snake River Plain, and I did not use the phrase supervolcano at all in 1989. So that phrase supervolcano wasn't even in the literature or public parlance 30 years ago. But we knew that there was massive high silica explosive caldera forming events, which we now call supervolcanoes. But if you're asking, when did we first realize we had these incredibly explosive volcanoes that dwarf Mount Rainier or something? Uh, I, I guess the answer is 50 to 80 years ago, but that's really, I hadn't thought about that before. I don't know. Uh, now we're off track with Lake Tahoe and other things. Let's try a few, I'll go back. I'll just answer a couple more. Kyle, when will 60 to 40 million year take us to Ellensburg region? Are you getting impatient, Kyle? 
Maybe some of our students are. Like I, we're, we're, we're taking the scenic route. We're de basically doing this. We started at Yellowstone. We're working our way back in time today. We kind of are working our way through Southern Oregon. And next week we'll be out here with Seletsia and accreting Seletsia. I suppose it's not till late this month when we're finally in the target area. But the target time zone, Kyle, uh, we're there now. So I'm sorry that I'm not moving fast enough for you. Sometimes it's good not to move too fast. <laughs> Entertaining myself now. Um, Richard, does the subduction rate influence volcanism? Yes, but I, I can't really, I don't, I don't know how to answer that beyond saying that. Two more, then we'll quit. I'm seeing some of you are expressing remorse that you didn't read the paper ahead of time. Well, first of all, you know, you're not, you don't have to do anything. I hope that you can enjoy this without reading the papers before or after. I hope that you can, I mean, if I'm doing a decent job, you can uh, kind of grasp what we're doing even without seeing the papers. But of course we have some who are really, really into this stuff, which is terrific to see, but not a requirement, of course. So my job is to try to make this worth tuning into even without um, a bunch of background. Maybe it works fine. You keep showing, you all keep showing up. So I guess it must be working at some, at some level. I'll find one more to finish on here. Jay, if the plume burns through the slab, wouldn't it bring elements of the slab along with it? Probably, yeah. And uh, <laughs> you know I'm weak on the geochem. So there's obviously debate on the role of atakites and whether it's truly just melted ocean slab or if it's something, a combination of plume and slab and something else. Uh, but there's... There's plenty more to be done. I can't end on that one. I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer. Let me end on something I can feel good about here. Really scrolling back now. Bruce, does the timing of the breakage of the slab relate to the Columbia River basalts? Uh, th that's how we'll finish. Depends on who you talk to, but it does seem like a growing narrative is that there was a gap. It's not worth getting the other board, is it? What was our gap between 20 and 17? Nothing was happening between 20 and 17. And then suddenly at 17.2, according to Emily Cahoon's works, uh, we begin uh, the quote unquote Columbia River Basalt Group and friends, uh, not just here, but regionally. Not just here, but regionally. Yellow, yellow, yellow. All of this is magmas coming to the surface at the dawn of the Columbia River Basalt group time. And so that is one of the main messages that Vic, Vic is presenting, that we begin the CRBs because we're done with the gap. And the gap was probably because of a slab blocking the mantle plume from getting to the surface. So that's a simple way to initiate the CRBs. And that's a different story, isn't it? Than just saying the Yellowstone mantle plume started here, which is the way I've taught it forever. Like we're kind of kneading our cake and eating it too, or whatever that idiom is that never made any sense to me. Like if we've got a long lived Yellowstone hotspot, which is the title of today's talk, why don't we have a continuous set of lavas from the last 56 million years? As you saw, Ariel was thinking about crust thicknesses. And if you had thick crust, then you'd have a quiet time. 
but the mechanism that Vic and others are visualizing is, is the slab significant enough to block the mantle plume, to block the hot mantle uh, from getting to the base of the crust? And therefore, are we starting the flood basalts with the last of the ruptures of the downgoing slab? Here's to you. Here's to your health on April 8th, 2021. Here's to the health of your parents. Here's to the health of your grandparents. Here's to the health of your children. Here's to the health of your grandchildren and great, great grandchildren. Here's to them. Here's to the physical and mental health of everyone in your community. I continue to help out down at the vaccine clinic and we had another shift yesterday afternoon. And uh, with each passing shift, we get more people vaccinated here in our valley. And um, I think there's a, well, we're still heading in the right direction. Here's to that. The next live stream will be Tuesday at 1 p.m., but there will be some sort of field video posted this weekend, and that will be episode six, probably titled, I don't know, Drumheller Columns or uh, Othello Columns or something like that, where we're going to be looking at a couple of very young Columbia River Basalt lava flows and some beautiful uh, colonnade. Hope you enjoy that field video this weekend, and I hope to see you again Tuesday at 1 p.m. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye. Thank you, I love you, and goodbye. Thank you, I love you, and goodbye. Thank you, I love you, and goodbye.